Hello, my dear viewers. This amazing story will be very instructive for you. It is very interesting and beautiful. I wish you enjoy watching it. I don't understand anything. Why do we have to accept in our house? Elizabeth wrinkled her nose as she stood by the window in a white suit of expensive fabrics that had been custom tailored. Elizabeth was a very beautiful woman who looked younger than her years. She loved to take care of herself and to dress up extra to emphasize her beauty as well as her status. After all, she was married to Henry, a powerful rich businessman. Do you think I like all this? Matthew chose some ragamuffin who must have designs on his money, cut her head open so she could take half of his assets in the divorce. Henry sighed heavily and took a sip of wine from his glass. He too wore a white shirt and slacks, and yet he looked very solid. The man was already gray by his age, but that didn't make him any worse. His sturdy body could give some of the younger people a head start. Matthew had the perfect person for a wife. Rich, beautiful, influential, intelligent. She wouldn't be ashamed to go out in public and he chose some waitress. God, I can't imagine having a waitress in our family and I immediately feel sick. Tell Maria to get me a sedative. Maria was a maid in the Smith house and she was setting the table, but she had to stop to bring Elizabeth a sedative. The woman drank it and sat down on the leather sofa. Her head was spinning from what was going on in the family. To the woman it seemed like a terrible dream, but she could not wake up and dispel it. Matthew could have achieved a lot. It's a lucrative contract money and useful connections. But Elizabeth, he won't listen to us. How many times have we explained to him that that marriage would be good for our family? He thinks only of himself. Henry, who dreamed of twinning with his business partner to combine their businesses and get even richer, is ruined. Our son doesn't appreciate us, Elizabeth said pitifully. Where did we miss it? Maybe he will come to his senses. Though Matthew is stubborn, He's a Capricorn, isn't he? They're very difficult to change their minds. The horoscope had nothing to do with it. Henry didn't believe that any stars could influence a person's character. It was our upbringing. He'd been told since he was a child to go straight to his goal. So he came to the waitress. Elizabeth cried aloud and almost burst into tears. My God, what will they say about us? What if we are thrown out of the White Lotus? I could not live without this club, where all the posh people would gather. After Matthew's unfortunate marriage, I'd either lose my season ticket, or I'd be disgusted and even judged. Darling, Henry sat down next to his wife. Don't be so dramatic. Maybe our son will come to his senses. He'll take a closer look at this girl and realize that she's not his level but she probably doesn't even have a high school education. Otherwise, she wouldn't be working as a waitress. He told me more than once that she was from a poor family. That's why she got a job as a waitress in some cheap cafe, helping her father. Oh, Matthew's bringing poor people into our family. He really wants to embarrass us. Henry rubbed the transfer tardly. The bride's name was Lily, who Matthew had fallen madly in love with. They had just met at the coffee shop where she worked. That night, Matthew lost his wallet with his money and bank cards. He only had five dollars left in his pocket, and he needed something to eat right away. He had just stopped at that inexpensive cafe. Her beauty, kindness, and charming smile struck Matthew. She really was a pretty girl with expressive blue eyes, blonde wavy hair, and quirky dimples on her cheeks. When Lily was serving Matthew, she overheard him talking on the phone and found out that the guy had lost his cash somewhere. She felt sorry for him. She'd been in a similar situation before. She went to the cafe and ordered a salad and compote, but someone had stolen her purse on the bus so she couldn't pay the bill. She had never felt so embarrassed. Usually they always paid everyone fairly. And even when the cashier might have given extra change, she was sure to go back to the store and report it. The manager then yelled at her, humiliated her, and made her work for the girl. She had to scrub the floor after her shift 
almost with tears in her eyes. So Lily decided to help a guy who was incredibly handsome. Dark hair, blue eyes, sharp cheekbones. He looked like he stepped off the cover of a magazine. How much do I owe you? Matthew asked. Not at all, the girl smiled. How so? Is there a charity event going on here? He smiled. No, she laughed softly. I unwittingly witnessed your conversation and I want to help you, so lunch is on me. No, I can't do that, don't even mind me. I can do anything in life, so don't worry about it. Matthew was amazed at the kindness of the waitress. He decided he was going to pay her back. He got into his Ferrari and drove home to get the cash. Then he drove back to the cafe where Lily was finishing her shift. I'm not going to let a girl pay for herself after all. He smiled and said, Here you go, but that's ten times as much. Lily's eyes went wide. This is for your tip. You've been good to me. I appreciate that in people, Matthew said. Thank you. I've never received such a huge tip. She thought she would never see him again, but she was wrong. What the girl didn't know was that Matthew had spent most of the night without sleep thinking about her. He had many girls he knew who were models. Matthew also had a potential fiancé that he had no feelings for. But his father pressured his son to marry Kate. However, they all lacked the main thing, soulfulness, simplicity, and most importantly, kindness. To Matthew, they were beautiful and soulless dolls. Capricious, demanding, and terribly stupid. He longed for another, for a girl who could understand his soul not just the money in his bank account. There were practically none of those around him. When he saw Lily, he knew at once she was the one he wanted to keep in touch with. So he arrived at the cafe specifically, at the time when the girl was finishing her shift. Hello, you are now our regular visitor. Lily smiled modestly and became embarrassed. That's possible. In fact, I came to ask you out on a date. On a date? Lily was surprised. I'm not ready, and I can't. Why? Do you have a boyfriend? Lily lowered her gaze. She liked Matthew a lot, but she was in a relationship with someone else, though it was hard to call it a relationship. I'm sorry, I didn't know, but at least let me take you home. There's nothing wrong with that. I think she did. She said yes. She lived with her father in an old village house. The village was a few kilometers from the cafe, and the girl had to take the last bus every night to get there. Lily didn't have a mother. She died when the girl was three. A severe illness had taken her. Lily vaguely remembered her father worrying about that. He cried a lot, even drank a lot, but he took care of his daughter. The Martins moved to the village from the city. After Andrew's business in the city went bad, Lily didn't know exactly what happened there, and her father did not want to talk about it. The girl only knew that for him it was a sore subject, so she never questioned. The only thing she knew was that it was expensive and problematic to live there. That was why they moved out of town buying the house she and Andrew still lived in with their last money. Getting used to the new way of life was difficult. In the city, they had all the comforts. They did not have to strain themselves much. But in the countryside, they had to work hard to get by especially in winter, but Andrew did not complain. How could he? He had a little daughter in his arms, and he had no time for weakness and self-pity. The man gained special respect in the village almost immediately. People treated the Martins well and kindly, but still did not miss the opportunity to discuss them. Andrew never said who he was in town, but the locals immediately noticed his keen and wary gaze. They realized the man had a rich past that was not without its share of criminality. This, of course, at first, was a source of tension. But then they realized that Andrew was a normal man who was not a danger. And so the quiet, peaceful life of Lily and her father went on. When she was in her early 20s, she began dating Patrick, with whom she had been in a relationship for more than two years. The residents gossiped about why Patrick hadn't proposed to her Lily herself didn't know why, but lately she hadn't wanted to marry Patrick because he had become cold to her and too demanding. 
Andrew had long ago told her to leave that half-wit. But her daughter, out of habit and loyalty, held on to him, though she was not happy with him. But everything was solved just this evening. When Matthew drove Lily home, they had a nice talk on the way, and Matthew was once again convinced that he wanted this particular girl. But he didn't know how to get her, because she was busy. The neighbors saw from the window that Lily had come home in a rich car, and those rumors reached Patrick. He got drunk, and in the morning he came to confront his girlfriend. What kind of a guy gave you a ride? He asked rudely, barely on his feet. Just a visitor from the cafe. They just don't take visitors. I've long suspected that you're on the side somewhere, pretending to be a saint while you're... He slapped her in the face in anger, so much so that Lily fell to the ground. You'll know how to cheat on me. I never cheated on you. Quietly, she said, with tears in her eyes, and it was true. It was just because of Patrick's low self. It was just because of Patrick's low self. The team that he always suspected the girl of cheating. It all happened in front of Matthew, who arrived to give Lily a ride to work. He immediately jumped out of his Ferrari and fought with Patrick. You're nothing but a man, raising your hand to a woman. Matthew prophesied and punched Patrick in the face again. You're still paying the price. Pity, said Patrick, already bogged down, defeated in the fight. We'll cross paths again. The earth is round. Go away, and don't you ever come near that house again. Matthew shouted after him and then helped Lily up. If I hadn't been locked up, I would have killed him for it, he said, with pity looking at the girl. You're not going out with him anymore. That sounded like a statement. I couldn't have done it after that. She was ready to cry. Don't cry. Let's go out tonight after work and you can relax. Lily nodded affirmatively in response. And that's how their relationship began. Elizabeth and Henry were happy to hear that their son had fallen in love. Of course, the father was a little saddened to realize that it wasn't Kate who had won his heart. But he had counted on this girl being of high society. But when the Smiths found out that Matthew had started dating a waitress, they made a huge scandal. But Matthew didn't let himself or Lily get hurt. He simply confronted his parents with the fact that he loved this girl and intended to marry her in the future. There was no avoiding the acquaintance, and Matthew hoped his parents would not act arrogant toward Lily. But how wrong he was. Elizabeth and Henry had shown with all their looks that the girl had no place in their family. They also weren't shy about mentioning Kate's name calling her Matthew's real fiancé. This introduction to his parents made Lily very upset. Toward the end of dinner, she went out on the porch of their country cottage and cried. I don't belong in your family, said the girl, and looked at her lover who came out to comfort her. My parents are complicated people, but they will get used to you and accept my choice. Give them time. They were rude and inappropriate to you, but I'll deal with it. I promise. I love you, and I won't let anyone hurt you. He kissed her, and Matthew kept his word. He had to deal with his father and mother for a long time so that they would no longer dare to express their disrespect for Lily. She's my fiancé. Get over it, and be kind enough to respect her. It's my choice. Oh, my God, Matthew, wake up. All she wants is your money. Yes, I've seen hundreds of girls like that. First, they pretend to be angels, and then they suck every last drop out. Lily is not like that, and I can see that. After all these years, I've learned to distinguish mercenary girls from normal girls. Matthew, you have to understand. It would damage the reputation of our family, softly said his mother. What is this nonsense? You've got some nonsense in your head. Your first priority should be your son's happiness, not your reputation. Henry and Elizabeth looked at each other. It was hard for them, but they accepted Lily. However, Smith had yet to meet Lily's beggarly father, which made them resentful. Dinner was prepared especially for his reception. Although Elizabeth was vehemently opposed to a lavishly set table, she thought a bottle of cheap vodka and sausage sandwiches would suffice for a beggar. Naturally, Matthew insisted on a good dinner, who respected Andrew. They had already managed to get acquainted. 
and Andrew approved of his daughter's choice. And so, on the occasion of a possible wedding, the man decided to visit his daughter and at the same time to meet his future relatives. Henry, is there anything you can do to keep our father out of here? The girl is enough for me, Elizabeth said. I have an idea. Matthew insisted on a good dinner. But it can't stop you and me from putting that worthless redneck in his place in another way. He went to a place where every day he saw a beggar who asked passers-by for money. The man never gave her any. He only looked at her with a kind of contempt. Henry hated poor people, as if he were allergic to them, and their family had not known want for generations. Henry and Elizabeth couldn't understand how people would stoop to a life of worthlessness when they had to beg people for money. In their minds, it was simple. If you didn't have enough money, you earned it, and if a situation arose in which you couldn't earn it, then the person in their eyes became a loser. Kind man, please give some food. The tramp bowed to him and gave him a pitying look to melt the man's heart, but she knew very well that Henry does not give to beggars. I'll give you money and lots of it. You don't have to do anything special. Just clean up my yard, rake the leaves, take out the trash, and a few other little things. We have an important guest coming today, and our maid can't get away. Would you be okay with that? Sure. The girl was even surprised that Henry had agreed to help. Yes, it was incomprehensible. But how could she refuse such easy money? Carla nodded to Henry, not daring to speak to him. She was afraid of accidentally annoying him, for then he would surely deprive her of her earning. How old are you? He was the first to speak. He was really curious to know how old the beggar girl was, for she looked like a young girl, twenty-six. Shyly, she answered. What on earth were you doing on the street? So young, you could have gone to work, instead of idly and humiliatingly asking people for money. Not everything is as straightforward as it may seem, Carla answered quietly. But it's just that someone isn't used to working, said Henry. The girl sighed heavily. She clearly sensed Smith's judgment, but Carla didn't want to tell her life story. Why should she? You couldn't change people's minds, so she didn't even try. And her life hadn't turned out as sugary as Henry's and his family's. The girl didn't have a luxurious country house. She didn't even have her own room. She lived in a dormitory with torn wallpaper that was no longer colored, with a common shower with mold that the tenants didn't really care about. The main thing was that the hot water flowed from the old kitchen, but little Clara was not as discouraged as her drinking mother. Every day she would have a feast with her cronies. Loud music played for a long time. The whole apartment was soaked with the smell of alcohol and cigarettes, and her cronies often had fights. At such times, Carla would run into the hallway, hugging her toy, sit down on the floor, and fall asleep like that. For the neighbors, it was already a familiar sight. Sometimes they would take the little girl to sleep over, and those were the happiest moments in the difficult and unenviable life of Clara. Soon her mother was driven to the point where she died one morning. She was walking from the store with another bottle of vodka, and then suddenly grabbed her heart. Yes, and so she dropped dead. Carla waited for her mother until late at night, and when there was a knock at her door, she opened it and saw the police and a child welfare representative in front of her. And my mother is not at home. Carla was not afraid of the police because they often came to them when called by neighbors. We're not here to see your mother. We're here to see you. Little girl, your mother is dead. And since you have no other relatives, you'll live somewhere else. Where Carla was all frightened, she didn't want to go anywhere. In an orphanage. No, I don't want to. You're lying about my mother dying. She couldn't have died. Carla cried. The girl wasn't treated with ceremony, taken to an orphanage where a few horrible years of life awaited her. Carla couldn't fit in there. She was afraid to say a word. She couldn't stand up for herself, so the boys and girls bullied her, stole her food, and sometimes beat her. 
The teachers turned a blind eye to everything because it was commonplace within the walls of the orphanage. At night, Carla would lie with her head under a blanket and dream that she would be adopted. But she was already too big. Usually they took in the little ones and the big ones had only to look out the window with envy. Carla had imagined many times that one day she too would step outside the orphanage holding her new mother's hand. But with each passing day, month and year, the hope faded and then it turned to dust. And the older Carla and the boys around her became, the more violent the antics of teenagers became. Often Carla had to beg the boys for her clothes back, covering herself with a greasy blanket. Nothing about Carl's miserable existence changed, so she decided to run away from the orphanage. To her, life on the street looked much more appealing than life within these walls. And as she walked, she easily put her plan into action. Carla feared that she would be actively sought, but no one wanted her. That's how she became a vagrant with no normal life, no papers with the sole purpose of surviving. If she could open her eyes the next day, she was already glad, because she could survive the previous day. And that was a real achievement. Henry and Beggar Woman went unnoticed by Elizabeth, Matthew, and Lily. And soon Andrew arrived. The sauna had been specially flooded for his arrival. What were Matthew and they happy about? They feared the reception would be cold, but for nothing. Because Matthew's parents were very polite and good-natured. I don't recognize my parents, Matthew whispered to Lily. Maybe they made it. Anything is possible. He kissed the bride's hand and they relaxed, thinking that everything would go humanly. Finally, I've wanted to meet you for so long, Andrew said good-naturedly and shook Henry's hand. Lily, she told me a lot of things about you. And only the good things. I'm glad to hear that, Elizabeth smiled falsely. And I'm not empty-handed. Andrew smiled broadly. He put the bag on the beautifully decorated table and began to lay out his pickles, honey, farmer's cottage, cheese. Elizabeth and Henry looked at each other and squinted their lips squeamishly, but said nothing aloud. Thank you. Elizabeth thanked me. Maria, put that away in the kitchen, please. And you, Andrew Martins, are welcome at the table. Everyone was seated. Henry began to ask the matchmaker about his life, about what he did. Andrew was a simple man and, and answered everything straightforwardly and unvarnished. He was not ashamed of his poverty, considering that money was not the most important thing in life. For him, Lily came first. There is no life without money, Henry observed. Hooked a piece of meat on a fork. It opens up a lot of opportunities. I couldn't agree more but money cannot give love or cure a deadly disease. It will not comfort us in times of need or give us warmth of spirit. You can buy anything, Henry insisted on his point. I dare not argue with you. Everyone has his own point of view, politely answered Andrew and smiled. He was not at all offended by the fact that he did not agree with his opinion. After a good meal, Henry suggested a steam bath in their sauna. Well... It's a good thing. I don't mind taking a steam and relaxing. Andrew laughed. Robert will give you everything you need. Elizabeth smiled tautly and folded her arms in a lock. Andrew was already anticipating a good time in the sauna. Relax, unwind. And then he wanted to take a little walk with his daughter. The man wrapped a towel around his hips and went inside, unaware that Carla was mopping the floors in the sauna. Seeing the girl, Andrew was confused and shrieked in surprise. Carla pulled the rag out of her hands, closed her eyes, and screamed. She became terrified. A naked tipsy man walked into the sauna where she was completely defenseless. The poor woman trembled and froze in place, unable to make a move. Carla, knowing what kind of surroundings she was in, took the situation very differently. She was in a rich house with people who were not shy about such entertainment. She had been offered a lot of money and lured into a sauna, and now a drunken man in one towel walked in. Naturally, the girl had no idea that Andrew was not one of the Smith's rich cronies, and she thought it wasn't by cleaning that she was offered the money. 
No, no, I'm not ready for that. Carla leaned against the wall. What? Andrew was surprised, embarrassed, clutching his towel tighter. Girl, you got it all wrong. He reflexively reached out to reassure her, but Carla put the mop in front of her again. Henry and Elizabeth laughed softly as they watched. Smith was doubly pleased. He had humiliated both the hated lettuce and the hated homeless woman at once. Elizabeth hugged her husband. Well done, Henry. Serves those poor bastards right. Looks like someone's going to get a mop on the head. What's the matter, Elizabeth? A tramp has a great way of making a little money. He doesn't have that kind of money, though. Henry grinned. But maybe a couple of dollars rubles will be enough for her. She wouldn't be too shy. Matthew and Lily heard Clara squeal at that moment and then witnessed an involuntary conversation between Matthew's parents. They looked at each other. They felt ashamed of Henry and Elizabeth, especially Matthew. After all, these were his parents. They had not treated their guests well, much less the unhappy girl. The boy didn't understand why it was necessary to humiliate his fiancée's father like that. It hurt him to no end, as if his father had just been humiliated in that way. Matthew wanted to fall to the ground while his parents gloated. I don't understand why they did what they did, the boy whispered, clenching his fists. Matthew calmed down. Lily tried to placate her fiancé, but she herself could barely hold back the tears. She could tolerate his parents' outbursts in her direction, but she felt terrible for her father, who had raised her alone and given her everything he could. Meanwhile, Andrew came to his senses a little. He looked closely at the beggar woman who was crying with her head bowed, and then he noticed a small silver tip on her chain. No, it couldn't be, quietly mumbled Andrew, being in such shock that many could barely hold him. He just can't. The fact is that he had already seen this pendant. Moreover, the exact same one belonged to his daughter. No. Andrew clutched his head and did not hold back tears. His behavior surprised Clara. She did not understand what was happening, but she wanted as soon as possible to leave the sauna and never again be seen by this man or any of them. She was about to run when suddenly Andrew sat down on the bench and grabbed his heart. He didn't look at all like someone who wanted to abuse her. Are you all right? Carla asked timidly. No, Andrew shook his head. At that moment, the matchmakers came into the sauna. Are you out of your mind? That poor woman's been mopping the floor for you for so long, and you're making such a slushy mess that you haven't seen a woman in so long that you're ready to shed tears? Henry grinned nastily, and Elizabeth giggled softly. Now the Smiths felt like some kind of sheep who could humiliate the common people and still have no responsibility. They teased Andrew, making inappropriate jokes to make him look even more pathetic. But they got a completely different reaction. Andrew went from a good-natured man to a stern man. His eyes darkened with genuine anger, and he was about to attack Smith. You think that's funny? All you can do is humiliate people. There's a rotten nature behind your wealth, but you'll regret it all. Sadly, he said. He took Clara by the hand and left the Smith house with her. How could you? Matthew shook his head. I thought this evening would go just fine. He was important to me and Lily. But no, you need to ruin everything. And why is that? What did you get? Did you expect it to do something to break my engagement? So you were wrong. I didn't think I'd be so ashamed of my own father and mother. I don't want to be here anymore. Don't forget. Matthew, you're talking to your parents, not your friends, Dad said sternly. He felt vulnerable. You know, I regret having parents like that right now. Come, my love, he emphasized the last word so that his father and mother would understand that this was very serious. Matthew, and they went to the cottage. They quickly packed up some things and left. Since Matthew didn't want to be in the house for another minute, Elizabeth put her hand to her chest. He'll come back, Elizabeth. Where will he go? It didn't turn out the way we thought it would. He put his head down and threatened us. That beggar Ford won't do anything. The son is offended, but he'll cool down and come himself. 
and I hope the waitress's father never comes here again. He didn't even hesitate to take this homeless woman by the hand. What a nightmare, just said Elizabeth. Meanwhile, Andrew and Carla arrived at the hotel in a cab. The thing is that Andrew specifically took all his savings to buy gifts for the matchmakers and the young people. But since it was not needed, he decided to spend it on two separate rooms in an inexpensive hotel. On the way, Carla asked what was going on. But it turned out that Andrew was not ready to talk yet. He only said that she would soon find out for herself. For some reason, Carla was no longer afraid of the man. Maybe because he gave off a good energy and he did not look like some bandit or pervert. So she trusted him, although she had long forgotten how to trust people. And he also stood up for her. He wasn't afraid of Smith, and he fought back. This is usually how a man stands up for his woman or a father for his daughter. Andrew went to his room and Carla went to her room. The first thing she did was take a shower. How she missed hot water and even more so a normal shower. Lily spent a full 40 minutes in the bathroom. Then they spent a full 40 minutes in the bathroom. Then put on her hotel robe, flopped down on the bed and laughed happily. Such a soft and comfortable bed. How she was tired of sleeping on the ground. And here at last, she could relax a little. It turns out she needed so little to be happy. Later, Andrew knocked on her door. May I? He looked in. Yes, of course. Carla immediately sat up on the bed. I see you've cleaned up. Poor girl so young and life has already taken its toll. Andrew looked at the girl with sympathy. Unlike Henry, he was sorry for the plight of the poor tramp, not judgmental. Tell me, please, where did you get that silver pendant? Carla looked at him. I've had it since birth, and to be honest, I don't know where it came from. I don't think my mother gave it to me. She wouldn't have had enough money. Carla smiled sadly. Are you sure about that? Andrew went pale. Are you all right? You don't have a face on you. Carla, tell me, are you sure that this pendant has been with you since birth, that no one gave it to you? Andrew asked seriously. He could not wait to hear the answer. After all, everything depended on it, even his life, which could change dramatically. Yes, I'm sure she was embarrassed because she did not expect such a strong reaction. Carla, Andrew took her hands. Listen to me now very carefully. You will stay in the hotel. Stay here for a while. I will pay for everything. I have enough money, but I really need your pendant. What do you need it for? I can't tell you anything yet, but you have to trust me. Don't be afraid. I just promise you that soon your life will change for the better. You don't know what kind of changes are waiting for you. You've suffered enough already. I can see it in your sad eyes. Carla, you will have a normal life with all its pleasures if you trust me with your pendant. The girl looked at the jewel again. She didn't understand how such a trinket could change her life. It was not even gold, but silver, which meant that it did not have much value but when Carla looked up at Andrew and saw a certain hope and goodwill in his eyes, she smiled modestly, took the chain from her neck and handed it to him. I believe you. That's all she said. Even if it doesn't work out, I'm already grateful for the warmth, the comfortable bed, and the hot water, believe me. That's a luxury for me. Andrew squeezed his eyes shut to keep from shedding a tear. He felt madly sorry for the young girl who had to suffer every day. He mentally promised himself that he would do anything to give her a decent life. Please do not go anywhere from the hotel. Here is my money. You can buy yourself something. It's not much, but it should be enough for you. Just wait for me, Carla. Okay, I hear you. Andrew immediately called his daughter when he left the hotel. He asked her to come and give him his pendant. She did not understand anything but complied with her father's request. When they met, the father assured his daughter that it was necessary. Lily was used to trusting her father, so she did not ask him unnecessary questions. But mentally, she still did not understand what had started to happen to her father. He was acting strangely. First he'd gone off with a girl, and then all of a sudden he'd asked her for a pendant, 
and now he seemed emotionally disturbed. I'd never seen him so lost and so sure of himself at the same time. Andrew sat down on the bench near the hotel, took out a handkerchief and wiped his forehead of sweat with it, and then looked at two identical pendants. He had also given it to Lily when she was born, and she had worn it all her life. One day, Andrew told Lily to keep this jewelry and to keep it always with her. And his daughter has obediently obeyed his request all these years. With trembling hands, Andrew first pressed the lid of one pendant, and then the other. Lily stared at it in shock and sat down at a loss beside her father. There's a secret button. That's crazy. I didn't know anything, said the girl, opening her mouth with the palm of her hand. Andrew didn't answer anything. He looked at the numbers that were engraved. Lily knew at once that it was some kind of code. Two pendants with different numbers, but it was one code that added up. What does that mean? Lily asked. You'll find out soon enough, daughter. He kissed her on the temple, but I'm sure you'll like it. Dad, it's a mystery. Is it safe? You didn't get mixed up with some gangsters or something? It's okay. Andrew interrupted her. Just to reassure her, I didn't get into anything. Lily went home with a kind of weight on her heart because she didn't like any secrets. Matthew didn't understand what had happened to his fiancée after meeting her father, but they kept quiet as she herself didn't know what was going on. The next morning, Andrew went to the bank, where he had a huge amount of currency in his account. The banker was surprised because no one had touched that account for 25 years, he told Andrew in amazement. I know, but his time has come. The man smiled. After Andrew received the full amount, the first thing he did was to buy himself the expensive car he had dreamed of for so long. To begin with, he fulfilled his lifelong dream, and then he wanted to help Lily. He drove Matthew to her house in his new car. When they saw it, they did not hold back a surprise sigh. Lily had no idea where her father got such a lot of money, because they had lived all their lives in the country and saved even on groceries, and now he was sitting in the salon of a luxury car. The horrible thought that he could kill someone popped into her head at once. Lily squeezed her eyes shut and dismissed the thought as quickly as possible. Father wasn't capable of such a thing. So, do you like the young people? asked Andrew when he got out of the car. He was smiling broadly and almost glowing with happiness. Lily did not recognize her father. Well, groomed without pompousness, but well, groomed without pompousness, but well, dressed, but from Matthew's parents he was distinguished by a friendly and warm look. Nice car, Matthew said. Where did you get it? How, where? At the car dealership, of course, laughed, the man replied, which struck Lily and Matthew even more. At the car dealership? Stupidly, Matthew interjected. There was no way he had it in his head. That his father couldn't afford such a car, and not even a brand new one. Surprised. Well, I like to surprise people. Andrew walked up to his daughter and handed her a thick envelope with cash. Daughter, this is my wedding gift to you. It's a lot of money. You can afford everything. Now, no one will humiliate you, Andrew said, referring to his matchmakers. Dad, but how? Why? How? The girl is completely confused. I do not understand. Just yesterday, they were a poor village family and literally overnight suddenly became rich. Don't ask me anything. Just accept my gift. Okay, don't worry. It's all legal. This has something to do with the pendants, doesn't it? Yes. Daughter, I'll come and see you again. Right now, I have to go to another place and take care of things. Daddy, I don't understand. The frightened girl began in a trembling voice. But her father, overflowing with joy, just calmed her down, kissed her on the forehead and left. Thank you, Lily whispered after her father, clutching the envelope to herself. Andrew arrived at the hotel and handed the exact same envelope to Carla. What? What is it? She asked stupidly, not believing that she had gotten her hands on so much money. This is yours, Andrew clarified. But where did you get them, and why do they belong to me? 
You, Carla, suddenly forgot how to breathe. Did you do something? The Smiths, is that their money? No, it doesn't apply to Smith. I'll explain later. But Carla, it's enough money for you to buy an apartment and support yourself. You won't be living on the streets anymore. Just accept it. Yes, thank you. She was still in shock. Can we go to the store? I'd like to buy some clothes. Of course, I could use a change of clothes myself. This outfit isn't bad, but it's a special occasion. Andrew's eyes gleamed with excitement. He went to the most expensive boutique. Andrew purposely wanted to choose a decent and expensive suit to present himself to the matchmakers in a new look. He could not tolerate the humiliation they had inflicted on him yesterday, so he decided to take revenge this way. Carla modestly tried on various dresses. She constantly looked at the prices and sighed heavily. It was not easy for her to take and spend a huge sum on some clothes, because the girl was simply not used to such things. Just a few days ago, don't you think so? He smiled softly, spoiling yourself. You make yourself happy. Carla sighed heavily and bought herself a suit and a dress. Then they went to one of the best beauty salons, where they both had their hair done in style. Andrew didn't deny himself the pleasure either. A good haircut, nail care, a neat haircut, nail care, a neat haircut. You're unrecognizable, Andrew said. Honestly, you too, she replied modestly. And the man laughed. Now it's time to shock someone. Should I? I don't feel like going back to that house, remembering Henry's evil grin and Elizabeth's unpleasant laugh. Worthy of Carla. Indeed worthy. Elizabeth and Henry have no respect at all for the common people. They just lost their heads from their wealth and feel like they are the lord of the world. It's time to take off their crowns and it will be good. If we do that, you and I are ordinary people. Imagine for a moment their faces. Andrew encouraged the girl, and he succeeded because deep down Carla wanted revenge herself. Andrew and Carla picked up Matthew and Lily to visit their in-laws. Lily was pleasantly shocked to see her father. He looked younger and fresher in his new look. Daddy, you are unrecognizable. You're so handsome, Lily said, and then she looked at Clara. Who's that? Is it yours? Well, no, no, not at all, answered Andrew. Remember the beggar who cleaned Smith's sauna yesterday? Yes, that's her. Her name is Carla. No way, exclaimed Lily, looking at the beautiful, stylish girl. Dad, what does that mean? Now I have even more questions for you. Girls, it won't be long before you find out. But in the meantime, he turned up the volume on the stereo. We should go to Henry and Elizabeth's house. Watching all this, Matthew couldn't shake off his anxious thoughts. But there was something else, a strange sense of pride in Lily's father. He didn't look like the kind of man who'd gotten that money the wrong way. And more importantly, that he hadn't spent it on himself alone, but on a total stranger who was in a difficult situation. His parents, despite their power and wealth, were incapable of such an act, and it made Matthew very bitter. When the car stopped outside the Smith house, Elizabeth and Henry were surprised, and they were not expecting anyone today, so they were not so unceremoniously pleased with the appearance of uninvited guests. However, when Andrew got out of the car, Elizabeth did not immediately recognize him. They could not have imagined that yesterday he was a poor simpleton, and today, suddenly, he was a rich man. Only my eyes deceive me. Elizabeth grabbed his shoulder. No, it's the matchmaker. That's right, the matchmaker. But how? Henry himself was shocked by this transformation. But most of all, they were surprised when Cara emerged from the car. Henry could not have thought it was the same tramp, but he remembered her face well, even though it was dirty. But now there stood before him a beautiful, well-groomed girl in an expensive suit. Swat is back. Welcome back. Henry immediately became friendly. After all, guests in such outfits and in such an expensive car should be greeted politely. I see you picked it up in a jiffy. What's the reason? Andrew grinned. 
no way. Were we ever evil? Oh, you're sly, aren't you, Henry? He grinned. You've played us for a prank, clever, and you pretended to be beggars so well. We are not one of yours. Andrew answered calmly, and it wasn't a prank. It was a humiliation, the man said, without any malice. Let's forget all that. We have turkey and delicious Italian wine for dinner tonight. Girls, do you like that? Smith asked politely. He surprised not only Lily and Clara, but Matthew as well. I don't recognize you, father. Matthew frowned. Is this some kind of trick or a setup again? How can you talk about your father like that, Matthew? Elizabeth stood up for her husband. Let's forget what happened yesterday and start our acquaintance anew. It really didn't go well, for which we sincerely apologize. Matthew was in silent shock. His parents had never apologized to anyone, thinking it was a real humiliation. They had always thought they were right, and here they immediately changed when they saw Andrew in a prestigious new car and also in a nice suit. If he had come to them in a cab in the same clothes as yesterday, they would have chased him away or pretended they didn't know. Matthew didn't doubt that at all. Elizabeth and Henry invited everyone to the table to taste the turkey. Where on earth have you been? Henry grinned. You think I've always been a poor redneck? Then you are gravely mistaken. I was as rich in the past as I am now. Are you serious? Even Lily was very surprised. Yes. After dinner, Matthew stayed with his parents in the house, and Andrew, Lily, and Clara went out on the terrace to talk. There, Andrew began his life story to set the record straight. In the 90s, when the country was in chaos and gangsterism, young Andrew was not left out and also decided to build his business without crime. At that time, nothing could be done. But Andrew did not want to get his hands dirty in blood, and in general was against gangland, so he did not take part in it. It was unreal to do something alone, so Andrew shared his business idea with a reliable comrade, with whom he had been friends for many years. He and Jason had been through many shootings and through enemies who wished them harm. Their friendship even endured a crush on the same girl. They decided it wasn't worth fighting over so they both let her go. Life was poor at the time, and both guys were already dreaming of reaching the top so they wouldn't need anything. This required an inner core, willpower, intelligence, and, of course, strength, without which nothing was solved in those years. They had it all, so Jason and Andrew went over their heads to finally get to the good life. They didn't kill anyone. They didn't frame anyone, and they acted in a relatively honest way making do with easy criminality, which was a principle they had developed, oddly enough, in the orphanage where they had both grown up. At a time when violence reigned within the walls of the orphanage, Jason and Andrew tried to stick together. Friendship didn't last long there because every orphan was willing to kill for food or clothes. Once we get out of here, I don't want to beg anymore. We'll have to make some changes in our lives, Jason said thoughtfully. Look at the flying sky, brother. I've been thinking the same thing all my life. I've been thinking the same thing all my life. I don't want to need anything and make ends meet, Andrew agreed. But we'll have to keep it together or we'll get eaten up fast. Who's against it? Andrew smiled. We'll have everything equally. No business behind our backs, no shady money. We'll share everything with you honestly. Brother, of course. And though times were tough, cruel, but they managed to get to the top. True, one time Andrew almost got killed. And if Jason hadn't arrived in time with his guards, Andrew would have ended his life while still young. The bandits broke into his apartment and wanted to take all the business and steal and Drew's money and precious things. He tried to resist, but he was quickly twisted and had a gun to his head. Where's the money? said the bastard in the leather jacket. You won't get anything out of me, damn it. Andrew was scared, but he wasn't going to give anything away. Who are you calling a devil, you bastard? The bandit swore and shot at the vase next to Andrew lying on the floor. As the shards of porcelain rolled like a grotto, his whole life flashed before Andrew's eyes. 
That's when Jason and his guards arrived. Immediately, they grabbed the bandits and grabbed their weapons from them. Brother, are you all right? I'll live, Andrew said, though he already had a huge bruise on his face. What shall we do with them? Turn them in. We're not going to kill anybody. That's our main rule. As it turned out, these bandits had long been wanted, as well as many others. At the time, they were involved in robbery, racketeering, and murder. After that, they had more than once had to fight off bandits and competitors, but despite all this, their business was still going strong and was bringing in decent money. And when Andrew and Jason started to stand firmly on their feet, they decided to get married. That was how Andrew met Jill, a girl from a simple family. Her parents were happy that a rich, respectable man had his eye on their daughter. At that time, Jill worked in a factory where they did not pay salaries for several months. Sometimes they only gave packets of macaroni and milk. Such a life would bore many people. Jill dreamed of getting out of it. Her parents told her not to think twice about marrying Andrew. And the girl herself was not against it. She liked him very much, and his beautiful courtship could conquer anyone. Jill didn't need anything else. She had money, imported things, and a nice apartment downtown, a real paradise. Jason, too, had found a life partner, only it didn't work out as smoothly as Andrew's. Mary didn't love Jason, but she married him just for the money. Her former suitor even walked into the wedding in the heat of anger. He was drunk and not shy in his language, but the conflict was quickly resolved by Jason's security guards. The man didn't notice that his wife didn't love him because he was blinded by love himself. He had no idea that in the future, such a beautiful, confident girl would turn into an alcoholic and get drunk to cardiac arrest. Family life was going well for both of them, and business was booming. Soon they had daughters a year apart. Jason had Clara and Andrew had Lily. And that's when the men decided to make an agreement between them that only they would know about. To be on the safe side, we need to make a backup that no one will know about. Times are turbulent, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Andrew said, what do you suggest? We have common capital, we split all the money in half, but we don't have a golden parachute, so to speak. One day everything can disappear. You know, there are many enemies, Jason, giving two numbers in each and you get a code. Isn't that dangerous? Jason hesitated. Look, we've been fighting off these bandits for years, and they're always looking for safes, trying to find something in the drawers. They wouldn't think of ripping off the girls' chains, and silver isn't valuable at all. So there's no profit in it for them. And if we're both done for, we'll leave a message for the girls, and they'll inherit everything. Well, that sounds reasonable. Jason agreed. We'll have to get to it as soon as possible. The next day they arranged everything. They thoughtfully deposited currency in the bank. Life was going as well as possible. But all good things come to an end sooner or later. Andrew and Jason's capital increased, for which their business is watched by law enforcement officials and, of course, competitors. Andrew and Jason ran their business carefully and always took care of their safety, but someone apparently started to leak information to the competitors. Something's not right here, Jason said one day when he and Andrew were sitting at the table drinking. The men were already pretty drunk. Somebody's selling us out. We'll figure it out, brother. We're rooting for each other. Andrew smiled and patted his friend on the shoulder. Jason smiled. I would tear anyone for you, for my family, especially Clara. I love her so much. She's my daughter and so am I, my Lily. Hey, okay, time to go home. The guards were waiting for Jason downstairs by the car, but as soon as Jason got in it, it exploded. The explosion was such that it blew out the windows of Andrew's apartment. Seeing all of this, the grown man screamed and cried loudly. His best friend was dead. Literally in an instant, he could not believe it because he had always thought that he and Jason were safe enough, but they weren't. Andrew ran out into the yard to the burning car and was in shock. He rushed to the car and grabbed onto it. I'll get my revenge, Jason. I'll find the bastard and I'll kill him. 
but he couldn't get revenge because they made a phony case against him, blaming him for the bombing. Yes, and yet there was a slight criminal element in their business. Andrew was imprisoned, and that is how their business and friendship ended. Andrew was released from prison, and during this time he had not heard from Mary and Clara. Although their wives were friends, Jill said that they had disappeared and never showed up since the day Jason was killed. I don't even know if they're alive. Maybe they were killed after Jason too, Jill said, cradling Lily in her arms. But all the news, the constant stress and fear, seemed to have made Jill terminally ill. While Andrew was in jail, their property was confiscated. The business was taken and literally left Jill and Lily on the street. Jill had to go back to the factory. The good thing was that they started paying money for Lily, but she died six months before Andrew got out of jail. Andrew could not do anything to help his beloved. He was not ready to lose his spouse, but he had to put up with it. The man decided to move away from the city and on the remaining money to buy a cheap house in the country. It was unlikely that anyone would find them there. And life was much quieter than in the bandit metropolis. Jill's death was long and painful. Andrew never left his beloved's side. Until the very last day he was by her side, loved her, cared for her, and though his heart was torn by the exhausted look of his spouse, he could not leave her alone for a minute. Andrew understood these moments for both of them, a real treasure. After all, there will never be another one of those. Later, the man pulled himself together because he still had Lily, who needed her father's care, love, and concern. The girl had no one else. Andrew often thought about Mary, and also about the code that was in Clara's pendant. He did not know it. Andrew really wanted to help both his and their family, but it was impossible. After listening to the story, the girls looked at each other and then automatically looked at their pendants. I thought my mother was a crazy alcoholic, Carla said quietly. She often talked about money of some kind. She was sure my father had left us something, but that wasn't the most important thing. She was the one who killed my father. Andrew couldn't believe it. Even though I was a little girl, I remember one conversation. My mother sat me down in front of her at the time. She got really drunk and started telling me some fairy tales about how we were rich and powerful. And I was still little and thought it was just another story to keep me busy. Then she told me that she had never loved her father, that she had had a lover who asked to book him. He promised that after he died, she and her mother would have a good life. Her lover seemed to be your main competitor. Mom was giving him all the information about your business, and he was in league with the police. She was hesitant for a long time, but eventually she gave Dad away by telling him what day he would be very drunk and without much security. But Mom got nothing. The lover ditched her and evaporated with all the real estate, business, and money of Dad. After that, we went to live in a dorm in another city, and Mom started drinking. I can't believe it. How could she? Andrew clutched his head in despair, the pain of his friend's death filling him again. I'm sorry. Carla put her head down. Mom, I was afraid you'd find her. I didn't know it was you. She said a lot of things but I didn't believe a word of it. You have nothing to apologize for. Carla, it's not your fault. I had no idea it could be so valuable, but I always liked it when I lived in the orphanage and then on the street, and I always thought it would bring me luck because it had been with me since I was born, and I was right. It's just a shame about the way things turned out. She lowered her head and couldn't hold back her tears. Lily hugged her. Don't cry. You have money now, and you have a family. Family. Yes. You and I are like sisters. After what Dad told me, I can consider you a sister. I'm sure your father would be happy to have us as friends. Lily smiled sincerely. She felt sorry for Clara and had a light-hearted feeling for the girl. Lily, I would be glad to be a part of your family. I've dreamed all my life of being close to people. You can't imagine how happy I am now. The girls hugged each other, and Andrew wept. 
He was happy for his daughter and for the daughter of his best friend and companion. You can rest easy now, Jason. Your daughter is safe under my wing. I take care of her as if she were my own, Andrew thought and smiled. A few weeks later, Lily and Matthew had their wedding, to which, of course, Clara was invited. Andrew was happy for the young couple, but Elizabeth and Henry did not share much joy, though she became the daughter of a rich man. Lily did not care. She had always liked who her father was. Matthew feared they might do something at the wedding, but the Smiths were quiet so as not to spoil the celebration or their son's mood. All they did was give a dry speech and hand the young couple the keys to the apartment. At the wedding, Carla gave a touching toast to the young couple's happiness and added that she was glad to be a member of such a friendly, wonderful family. Lily wept, hugged Clara, and called her her sister. Throughout the evening, Clara was kept close to her handsome friend, Matthew, who turned out to be a simple, kind, and cheerful guy. Matthew and they lived in their apartment, and Carla temporarily rented next door. At this time, Andrew was busy building houses in the village. For himself, Matthew and Lily, and a separate house for Clara. He was happy that his children and his best friend's daughter's lives were getting better, and that they were all truly happy.